Welcome to this episode of A Facilitator's Journey. Today I am talking to Phil Walsh, a facilitator, a trainer, a man who lives on purpose. We talk about his journey from working in a training agency as their sales director, becoming an associate in the tumultuous times of 2007, 2008, through to working out his niche and who he really wanted to be working with and the power that that clarity has given him to be able to then talk to people in a way that means they know that he is the right person for them. And he knows that he is working with people that he really wants to work with and support. So join Phil and I, get a cup of tea, sit down, tune in your ears and take a perch on the pink sofa. Hey, Phil, how are you doing? I'm really good, thanks, Kessie. Good to see you. And you, welcome to um, the SOF podcast, A Facilitator's Journey. Uh, Phil, how do we know one another? I am one of many people who reacted to your amazing LinkedIn presence and social media presence uh, many years ago. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for like 2014, 2015. That means we're coming up for like 10 years. If it's this year, it's 2014. Mm. It might be 10 years this year. So um, I remember reacting to a post and being like, hmm, sounds interesting. Tell me more. Um, and yeah, we started chatting. And it, a few months later, I went to an event in London with you. And Yay. since then, it's been a like a dream. It's been like a bromance, romance. I don't know what the girl <laughs> version of a bromance is. A workmance. Um, yeah. Phil, sorry, everybody. Uh, we're a bit giggly because we know each other really well. So, Phil, uh, help our listeners understand a little bit more about you. How do you, what do you do? How do you describe what you do? So I work with organisations of purpose and I work with teams within uh, those organisations, charities and NGOs, and I help them achieve their goals. I help them do what they need to do. And I say that because specifically, I feel like often people come in to be like, I do this or I do this and I'm bringing X. And I'm just like, what do you need to do? I'll help you get there. Nice. Brilliant. OK. And so today we're just going to talk ab about your your journey in this world of um, do you call yourself a freelancer? How do you describe um, your freelancer, solopreneur? I'm not. I'm not hung up on the title, so I'll go with go with what's around. Um, I think I probably refer to running my own business uh, more than being a freelancer. Um, you know, nice. just something innately snobby about me and wanting to be kind of it's more a limited than. company, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. It, I'm I'm very happy to go with the term that is that others are comfortable with. I'm all of those are true, right? Freelancer, solopreneur, run my own business limited company uh so how long have you been in this industry how many years have you been mm, it depends how you define it so oh, i started in l and d in 2022 um so that would be 22 years uh but i started running my own no, business no. 2022 no 2002 2002 so it would be 22 years i got hung up with all the twos I'm Sorry, normally good yeah. with math. It's very confusing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then uh, to add in another two, uh, I started my own business 12 years ago. Okay. okay. And what were you doing in the first 10 years in L&D, just to name it so people can yeah, understand? Yeah, I, I, started, I started as a graduate um, salesperson uh, working for a training company uh, selling to big corporates and selling them training mm -hmm. solutions, actually business games. So it was really fun. Um, and then I, I didn't realize at the time, but I was doing a big uh, like work experience because I was watching all these facilitators and trainers come in and deliver. Um, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. So then I had all this experience to fall back on. So when did you start to train and facilitate yourself? Uh, I remember very specifically, it was it was sort of coaching was the way in. 
because we'd sold a program, or I'd sold a program, a training program to a law firm where we needed four coaches on the end of day two to really coach the actions into the individuals to take forward. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had three booked in uh, and was looking for the fourth one. And my boss was like, well, why don't you do it? I said, well, I'm not not a qualified coach. How could I possibly? Um, And he gave me a book on uh, action learning sets and was like, read that Uh, and come back to me in a week. And I came back to him in a week and was like, oh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. It's just having a chat. Nice. And and how how long did you sort of stay in that space of working for the for the training agency and part selling, part delivering? It was probably like the last four years. So yeah. Nice. And after that initial going in on the end of day two and coaching, how often did you then get to coach or get on your feet and train? Well it it was really interesting. It was a commercial organization and I was a commercial focused person. Um, and I mean, from a pure, uh, nuts and bolts point of view, I could either pay a freelancer to come in and facilitate on my program or I could do it myself. So my gross profit and hence my commission on every program I sold would be a lot more if I could deliver it. So I had to, I had to balance kind of um, how it was working uh, because I was I was motivated to do it because I loved doing it. And I was also motivated to do it because I earned more commission when I yeah. delivered the training. Interesting. So two things go through my head. One about the experience of doing the delivery in-house before you stepped out on your own. But secondly, this piece around when you sell a program do you do the delivery yourself or do you get someone else to do it but by getting someone else to do it you free up your time to do more selling so you could argue that you need to do the maths don't you what what it what is more financially viable is it is it do the work yourself or is it um ask someone else to do the work and then you you win more work well, the numbers spoke for themselves for me because I was the the numbers I was billing per year and per working day. I would earn a lot more by by saving the day for my sales time. Um, but by that stage of my career, I'd already worked out that money wasn't the biggest driver for me. So I would earn a lot more in total by having the experience of delivering um, and getting that that yeah. bonus commission and earning not. And earning not being about the money at this point, it's about the experience, mm. about my development, about my growth. No, nice. yeah, I and don't. Was there... I, wa- I wasn't oh. mature enough to call it that at the time, but I, I, I innately kind of knew there was something more to. I got more yeah. from it. And, and it's something when people say, "Oh, how do you get into training or facilitation?" I often say to them, um, if they're in the corporate space, what opportunities have you got to to practice your craft whilst you're you're still gainfully employed and earning a monthly wage? Because it's a it's a great place to to learn and be paid versus step out and have to fend for yourself. Yeah, and often employers are really keen to use that kind of training up internal people because two reasons one it it actually helps with retention and kind of people who are thinking they might leave and change careers can stay and do another five years of being upskilled um Mm -hmm. so that it can help with their retention but also it it the coaching that they'll deliver internally or the facilitation they'll deliver internally because they know the mechanisms of what's going on internally they can deliver loads of value by by doing yeah. that um, as an internal or indeed as an external once if they do actually leave. Yeah. And you you, you said flippantly, oh, my boss threw a, an action learning book at me and told me to read it uh, to help me understand what to do. After that moment, what what did you do to help yourself start to learn more about the world of training, coaching, facilitating? Oh, that's good. I think I've always been quite book based. Um, I'm quite heavy on self study. Um, it was actually the same 
the same chap who put me on to um, my first NLP book, which was mm-hmm. NLP at Work by Sue Knight. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that was a real game changer for me in terms of understanding how I learn and grow and understanding, yeah. not only understanding my own latent motivations, but also understanding how I could change those motivations and adapt and control those mm. motivations. Yeah. Uh, NLP, uh, um, for those of people who don't know what NLP stands for, it's Neuro Linguistic Programming. Uh, it's one of many schools of, what, what is it a school of? Learning, development, growth, coaching, a way of. Uh, and I that was one of my big eye-opening phases of my life I thought I was off to learn about NLP so I could weave it into some workshops that I was being asked to deliver internally what no one had ever taught me was when you go on these kind of events whether you're going to go and learn to be a coach a facilitator use NLP use a particular system you do the work on yourself at the same time and it was revelatory like literally loads of sort of what I call sort of palm palm to brow moments of oh that's why I do this oh that's why I behave this way don't like this do like that yeah I like NLP but I know it's not so, everyone's cup of tea but yeah I, I love it in fact I've got a client yeah. uh this week who we were just brainstorming what we might do with them and they've been like yeah okay let's introduce them to the concept of NLP and it's like oh brilliant this is going to be so much fun (laughs) so um you did lots of book-based learning you did lots of practice so you sort of got more skill um learnt skills practice skills how what happened next how did you how did you decide to leave because I think leaving the safety of the monthly salary is 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 a big deal for all of us yeah luckily it was um I say luckily it was kind of taken out of my hands um I was I was responsible for the global sales revenue of the organization uh at the time of the 2007 financial crash uh 2007 2009 financial crash and um the numbers weren't where I'd promised they would be um and so uh my role was made redundant um and after being kind of absolutely uh incandescent with rage at the at the absolute temerity of them to suggest that I was in any way at fault I then discovered that I had a really nice little redundancy package to go away and think about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be in this world and um that's and and also because despite my anger I'd left on good times um they also then said like almost immediately can we also use you as a freelance facilitator because you know how to deliver all these programs and you know the clients and so yeah something like about six weeks after I left I was delivering Mm. as a freelance facilitator for them in India and feeling like my world had changed completely yeah oh fascinating so how what happened so this is really good so I always say please have a plan before you leave the corporate world and what I'm noticing more and more at the moment is there's a lot of people out there going getting dissatisfied with their the status quo in the workplace and I think because the world of freelance um is more accessible like we talk about it a lot more it's whereas I left in 2007 as well I didn't quite know that this world existed um and having to work that out because LinkedIn was only a year old. So we, and I, even though I was on LinkedIn, it's nothing like it is today, let's be clear. Facebook only just arrived. So, you know, that world that many of us are so used to in social media land wasn't there. How, how did you go about finding work? Like help, help us understand what it was, what was it like back in the day, Bill? <laughs> Um, it was all about my network, really. Um, and it, I, I was an early adopter of LinkedIn. So I do, yeah, I was still in connection with a lot of people um, who I knew from my my earlier part of my career. Um, 
so I remember, I remember just, just reaching out to people who I liked. <laughs> um, there was a guy who sold us this amazing uh, mind map smart technology, which is a way of of taking notes in a meeting that leaves you completely clear on the outcomes. And it was mm. it was brilliant for me as a dyslexic. It really helped organise my thinking. Um, and I thought this tool should be everywhere. So I offered to go and I really liked the guy. So I offered to go and support him in a sales meeting and give him feedback afterwards. Um, and I spent most of the day with him in London, uh, attending a meeting, giving him feedback afterwards. And then on the, on the train home, uh, he messaged and was like, I've got another meeting next week. I want you to come to, but I'd like to pay you for that and do exactly the same as we've done today. And today was so valuable. I'd also like to pay you for today and propose the rate and said, just invoice me. And I was like, I was still going for interviews for jobs at the time. So I was like, right. Oh, I think I'm going to do this, this oh. thing right here. So yeah, it was just to go back to your question. It was from my very start. It was all about connecting with people who I felt connected to. Yeah. And when nice. I connect, when I reconnected with people who I'd felt a connection with, they either gave me work or suggested other people I might like to talk to, or I nice. could potentially work with or gave me advice. Um, yes. I remember working with the head of L and D from a law firm that I'd, I'd sold into for years. Uh, and she helped me brainstorm my business name just come up Brilliant. with my business name it was just like well that would have taken me ages on my own but we've done it together that was nice lush um someone said to me like if you're going to go freelance and work for yourself you you need to be a be, be comfortable talking to your network and networking um be be prepared to put the hours in when it comes to running the business so it's not just about what you're good at as in you've got to be able to know how to like do all the back back office things and then thirdly he said you need to be bloody good at what you do it's it's no point coming out being average because there are so many people out there now like you need to be able to stand head and shoulders above others um and I think that gets yes people shout about stuff on LinkedIn and oh, I, I need to have a, a bit of a rant on this one okay so on on LinkedIn and social media Phil I sometimes see people go, I'm this, I'm that, I'm bloody amazing. And then I know them and I'm like, no, you're not. And it just is amazing, the smoke and mirrors. So someone has recently put out that they are a fractional chief marketing officer. But I've looked at her and what she does and I'm like, yeah, you are, but you're not. So if someone said to me they were a fractional chief marketing officer, I'd expect them to come with experience from, I don't know, an FMCG, like a Unilever or a big bank or fintech or pharma. Um, and she isn't. She's just a very good virtual assistant who also knows how to do great marketing. But she's titling herself up as a CMO, fractional CMO. And I'm just like, I just feel that's massively misleading. Sorry, that's a rant. Is that wrong? Is that <laughs> no, wrong? it's fine. It's misleading. It's fine. I mean, you can, you know, I can only... I can you put me in a mind of NLP, so it it causes me to think: What is it about that that you don't like about your presence on LinkedIn? Oh, <laughs> I just think you have to speak your truth and be yeah. honest to people to be credible. And if you're mm. hiding behind titles and labels, you can mm. do that. But I think you get caught out in the end. Yeah, personally, yeah. But that's a belief. Yeah. And we all run belief, and I think that's. And that's probably why you have such a big following on LinkedIn and Twitter and Insta is because you, you are so real. I remember recently you asked that question of like, what what should I talk about on here? Like my business and what's going on perf personally or running the business. I was like, all of it, Kirsty. I love all of it. Keep going. You want the truth. Yeah, it, yeah. it's getting interesting, isn't it, on LinkedIn? Because uh, I'm doing a 100-day series uh, called uh, An Ordinary Business Life. So all I do is every day just share something that's happened in the business, which feels quite exposing at times, but it's great fun because mm. it's what's interesting is, and as you've commented before, people haven't, 
people relate to it because it's their world as well or it's mm. a world they want to inhabit so I just think what's the harm in sharing the good the bad the ugly the indifferent of me running a business if it's going to mm. help someone else just like we're doing here in these conversations like people can people can like take what they need from it and if they don't like it they just stop following me and I'm really cool with that as well I've worked out now yeah it's none of my business if you like me yeah, when when we can't be for everyone, right? And we can't try to be for everyone. I have. I'd rather be Marmite. I love Marmite. I'd rather be a jar of Marmite, I think. Love me or hate me, people. Love me or hate me. If you've got this far in the podcast, I'm guessing you quite like us, otherwise you wouldn't have listened for you know, <laughs> the last twenty minutes. Anyway, sorry, back to you, Phil. i I'm really sorry. Um So off you go. You've left the corporate world. Or you've mm. left the security, actually, you've left the security of that mm. nine to five, monthly salary, consistency, mm. knowing what's coming, and you've stepped out and like you're you're having these realizations, oh, people pay for what I know. People this makes me happy, like supporting yeah. others. Um, give us a help people understand like those first few years. What what sort of work were you doing? So all kinds of uh associate work. So because mm-hmm. You know, I'd, I'd come out and I, aside from that little bit of sort of sales consultancy, I'd landed in the world of associate trainer um, for my previous company and then took almost like took that title and threw it all over the Internet and was like, right, who else can find me associate trainer, mm. associate facilitator uh, gigs? Um, I remember working with one company as an associate trainer where I learned a really strong lesson. I was really busy, was like three or four years in, and I've been um, doing associate work for loads of different people. Um, and I, someone asked me to go into London. It was a law firm again. I've worked with quite a lot of law firms. Um, I remember going into London to do an afternoon session. And so it's it like started at one, but obviously I needed to be in the room at 12. I had decent amount of travel and safety time to get there. So just before I went in, I, I picked up a, a sandwich and a coffee and kind of had my lunch and then went in and delivered the training. Um, after delivering the training, uh, I sent through my invoice for my time, my travel, and my lunch. And they returned the invoice and said, we won't be, we won't be paying for your lunch. And I was... I was absolutely, again, I was, I'm going to go incandescent again. I was absolutely furious. I was just like, how can you not, like, you've got me in central London. Like, am I taking a sandwich in my bag with like my suit and all like my training Like Paddington gear? Bear. <laughs> where, 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 how does this fit for you not to pay? And I mean, I it sort of might, might say uh, too much about me, but um, I never worked with them again. I was just like, no, you Having, I think it's because I'd been on the other side of the table, right? I'd I'd worked with associate facilitators, and I'd been signing off their invoices and yeah. kind of going, okay, yeah, you sent, um, you know, you did some international calls and they added to your phone bill. I can understand that. I was part of those calls, yeah. so yeah, we'll pay for that. And and I ha- occasionally had to have conversations where I said, do you really think this expense is justified? And can we talk about it? And I would. I would always be kind and generous and open and curious in how I approach yeah. that relationship. So I felt like when I just got a flat, it's not in the contract. No, it's just like, you're not for me. We're not working together. So what, so this is interesting. So like, let's talk about associate relationships. Like what makes a good associate relationship? Do we think like what are some, what are some of the core ingredients? Open. I think I, I I really appreciate the transparency. All my best mm-hmm. associate relationships have been really high transparency, really high um, valuing each other. That's where the transparency comes from. It's it's yeah. like the value we place on each other's input. Yeah, I think is, and is what, crucial. So value of um, what you input. What else do they? Does it pay dividends to be transparent about, do you think? Rates and fees. Like, it sh- 
again, all my best ones have been really clear about, you know, this is, we're bringing so much IP to the table, we're going to give you 50% of the rate or, you know, we're, we've had this relationship for 10 years and we're going to give you 40% of the rate or do you know what, this is brand new opportunity. Um, you're bringing the content. We're going to, we're going to take 20% of the rate. And it's, yeah. I don't know, it, whatever those numbers are, doesn't annoy me as much as just not knowing. <laughs> yeah. It's having the conversation, isn't it? Yeah. I was going to say like, what are some of the things that would be a red flag for us in an associate relationship? So um, demanding my time for free, like Mm. you can make offers of associates hanging out together and make offers for the value that we can have by hanging out together. So in December, I spent two days um, hanging out with a a company that I do associate work for um, and it was brilliant. But crucially, it was an invitation. And I've Mm. had that before where it's like, we're having our annual associate get together. Everyone must be there. Right. I've got another client that day. I can't be there. I'm not going to be there. So, yeah, Yeah. the invitation rather than the demands is of my time is really important to me. Nice. Thank you. Uh, So I know that now you have quite a few of your own clients, like direct clients so what what changed well I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> blame you for a lot of this but early in our <sighs> relationship <laughs> you I was I was very conscious sort of like six seven years into running my business I was very conscious that I should <laughs> niche um right and it was clear from everything I'd read and all the case studies and people I'd spoken to everyone that was doing well and kind of forging their way had their niche and their market. But I had this, this idea that I still hold that I'm not bringing the thing. I'm just helping my clients to get where they want to go. So I was like, well, I can't, Mm -hmm. that means I can't niche. And I fundamentally, I didn't want to. Um, And I've worked on this in, in workshops with other people. It's like, when you're communicating to other people the power of one story the power of being just known for one thing is that it's instantly memorable it's instantly connectable oh i get that phil works with charities to help them achieve what they need to achieve it's kind of like simple yeah but when you're thinking about yourself you're like well phil also can help organizations with presentation training with facilitation training he can also help organizations with sales skills he can you know there's a breadth of things I can do with organizations and teams so when I think of myself I like to be known for all the good things I can do but when I put myself in my client's shoes they just want to go aha I know Phil does that and so it was so how I was did you get to that point I was struggling with it until you introduced me as someone who works with charities to a group of facilitators. And I went, oh, that's my niche. That's what I do. And it was it was just a, it, it often is with me because I'm really slow until I get there. And then when I get there, I'm quick. Um, so it was like, it was like a flick of a switch. And I was like, yeah, I work with charities. That's what I want to be known for. That's what I want to do. And so what did that give you by saying? So when you niche as well, I think you can go two ways on the niching. You can niche into a channel, which you've done. So charities, NGOs, or you might niche down into a topic like I've done, like facilitation and training. Like that is what I geek out on, but I'll work across multiple channels, as we both know. Um, What has it given you niching and saying, you know, yeah, I'm my my primary clients are charities and NGOs and actually you you introduced yourself with you work with clients with purpose so how yeah, that, have, how's that helped I, you I often use the term organizations of purpose because I think it, yeah. it goes beyond um charities mm-hmm. and NGOs um nice. and what it's given me I mean 
it's it's just so straightforward to kind of understand what my where my target is and like yeah. people who I want to be talking to and people who I want to get in front of um I think before I'd just be I feel like I was just shouting into the wind and being like hey does anyone want some me um and just kind of throwing it out there and hoping some of it would land whereas mm-hmm. now I get to speak to charities and say hey it was really nice working with you on this project do you know any other charities who you think I could work with um the other thing it's done is it's enabled me or driven me on a path to become a registered b corporation so it, an organization of purpose myself through the work yeah. I do for the for the charities and NGOs so um it's kind of that helps me put an identity on my business I think and put yeah. an identity on my on my career and my working life um nice yeah and finally people are able, able to describe what I do to others um rather than just be like yeah Phil kind of does his own thing I don't know if anyone else had this but like friends and family are always just like can we talk about what 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 do you do <laughs> yeah but I guess also has it helped you get more laser focused on the your positioning in your marketing positioning when you're talking to potential clients like naming who you want to talk to so it's really easy for those organizations with purpose to go oh yeah that's us we need to talk to him because he understands our world yeah in in fact i mean i could even go to the next level i'm I'm sort of tempted to go to the next level because it seems like within charities i'm really focusing on the interface between charities and their partners um so Mm -hmm. helping charities to work with their partners uh to to show up in a, a superb way whether that's you know, facilitating an online webinar yeah. uh, for a sector or whether it's kind of um, working with a team and their partner at a kickoff of a partnership or a milestone of a partnership and running an event for them around that seems to be a bit of a, a niche within a niche that is is developing for me. But that works as well. Um, we start, so how have you now, like obviously you started to move away from associate work and I'm, I'm guessing it's not as simple as you flipped a switch and you went one, one week you were associate, the next week it was all direct clients. I'm guessing there was a, a point in time where it floats. When, I'm curious, how do you find your direct clients now? Like, how does that work? Um, it's almost entirely word of mouth and LinkedIn. So my network within the sectors that I've worked in and within some yeah. of the big NGOs that I've worked in, um, I've you know I've just had someone this morning pop up on my LinkedIn feed of like people who have viewed your profile, um, and it's someone yeah. who I've worked with previously at an NGO who's now at another NGO in a director role, um, and I know that the only time we ever crossed paths when we worked in the same organisation was when I was facilitating a big event that he was part of, so. Um, yeah. I can I can wonder that he might have been interested in some of my more more recent musings on facilitation, or I can assume yeah. that my name has cropped up in his mind, or someone else has mentioned me yeah. about an event that's coming up for them. And and so things that are going through my head as you're speaking is like a to find direct clients. Yes, there is the power of LinkedIn, and and to be on there, be consistent, share your messaging. Then there's as you said, your network itself. I, I also want to name time like think how long you've been in the industry how do we do our maths 20 years um like and i've been doing this since 2008 and running sof school of facilitation since 2015 so it takes time to build momentum and get to that point where people where you are on people's lips as a brand or a name of someone. And and I think that's really important for people who are listening to this, who might be starting out to know that what you're seeing with me, SOF, with Phil's work, it's not overnight successes. It's like, we've been working at this for some bloody time. (laughs) And I wish there was a magic pill that I could give others and go, look, just take this, it's gonna be fine. Give it three months and all will be good. Because that's not the truth. And I just wondered no, what what would you say to people? Like what are some of the things that they could 
they can do to keep building up their business? Um, well, I, so, so I can get really cliched about this, right? Former sales director run, run sales team and kind of um, helped people learn how to get into professional selling. Um, and I think one of the things I talk about is professional persistence. Um, it's like going after a lead and you, you don't always get responses, right? It's like, you know, they talk about, I think it's guerrilla marketing talks about like seven touch points before you get a, a decent response. So it's, it's kind of just, just carrying on in the, if, don't get me wrong. If people say, no, I'm not interested, you stop. <laughs> but until yeah. people say, no, they're not interested, just because they haven't found the time to reply to you, you know, the, often the people we're targeting are getting hundreds of emails a day. So if they haven't replied to your email, they're, they're busy. They're, you know, doing Do, other things. And Yeah, that's true. Do you cold call? No, no, I, I used to. I have a lot in my career um i think it's probably oh, I don't... if i've got someone's number i might call them i'm not afraid to call someone but only because i've i've done it so many times right i've been through that's amazing been, been through the process so many times i've built this resilience and this um i guess this feedback loop as well that is is attuned to not kind of making up a story and not and ju just always going for the fact is like and the fact is that if someone hasn't replied i don't know what they're thinking and so i can assume that they might still be interested i can assume yeah. that they might be busy for a couple of weeks i can assume anything but what we tend yeah. to assume is that someone who hasn't replied within two days wants to kill us yeah or doesn't want what we want to offer um i think we're in the era of um I call the cold email marketing i mean mm. the number of un I emails from really random people who don't mm. even know me that i'm receiving mm. i delete at least two or three a day mm. i started to reply to some of them as well when it's so they're so off the mark of what mm. they're offering me i sometimes i sometimes uh cheekily quip back yeah I got a really nice one the other day where it was uh, a marketing company who would who they're a B Corp. They'd found out that I was a B Corp. So they were messaging to ask for my services. Did I want their services? And it was just it was designed at a much bigger business than me in terms of their offer. Um, but because yeah. they used the B Corp route, I just dropped them a quick note and said, no, thanks. Not really relevant for me. Uh, and I got a nice email back saying oh thanks for taking the time to reply yeah um and yeah i think it's that that training in the feedback loop of being used to just putting myself out there and then finding out if there's an answer and being curious yeah. about whether there's an answer and not taking silence as a no not creating a no out of silence yeah that's very true anything else that you have taken from your time as a sales director into managing your own clients that you think is useful for others to know about? I guess at a, at a higher level, I'm going with the gut a lot more. Like I sell to people where it feels right. <laughs> like when I'm connected, as I think I talked about the, the connection beyond the connection. Like it's not just mm. the fact that we're talking. It's the fact that I can feel us connecting as humans. And I know that mm -hmm. when I get a sense for that, I'm more likely to work with that person. And sometimes that's been yeah. years down the line. But I just, when there's that feeling, I know that it's going to work out some way or the relationship's going to be beneficial for me in some way. Yeah. And so I, and so I often, I often name that with prospective clients. I've just done that recently at an end of a project between like three or four different NGOs. And I, yeah. I really got on well with this one person. I just messaged Lovely. her afterwards and was like, hey, let's stay connected. I'd love to work with you and your organisation some more. So we're going to see if that works out. Nice. So there's something about trust your gut instinct, notice where you get a, a pull towards someone 
yeah, I've, I've noticed the same. The other thing I'd say mm. is as well, um, so I send out a monthly newsletter and I got um, an email this week from someone in Australia and saying, oh, the link's broken to someone's website where you put an offer on. And it was a, the email was over two years old and the website was under reconstruction. But what it showed me was when you're using something like newsletters, sometimes people save them and they're going to come back to it. And therefore, you just never know who's lurking like watching in the wings and, and on LinkedIn, I think there's, a, I don't know what the percentage, but only a very small fraction of people actually proactively talk and message on LinkedIn. A lot of people admit to lurking and just observing. And when the time is right, they will come forward and they will connect with you. I think that's something that I notice often happens. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, yeah. I've got some quick fire questions for you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Uh, what advice would you give to someone starting out as um, a trainer or a facilitator? A quick fire go, be loud, tell everyone. You never know where the next prospect's coming from. Nice. Um, who do you follow in social media land that you think others should know about? Um, I'm uh sort of facilitated crushing at the moment on a guy called thomas lanthola who i'm sure you oh, you've thomas. come across um like recent posts on disruptive facilitation and yes. it's just like this he he speaks wisdom i like it yeah go find thomas he's he does a re always does a, like great posts and there's a series that he did and he's he's written on a whiteboard two or three words and then he talks about what that actually means within the world of facilitation and he's always coming up with really great advice yes 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 to that um what book do you recommend to people my favorite and it's been my favorite for a few years is uh the amazing power of liberating structures um which was two guys who worked for years doing workshops in a business and at the end of their careers went, we can't let this die with us. And they just made it all open source. Uh, and it's yeah. all these different ways of running workshops that just are brilliant. You, um, you were definitely one of the first people who brought that liberating structures to my attention. I talk about it all the time now. I've got the book somewhere over there. I've got the, you can download a free app, everybody. Just go to your preferred app store. It's called Liberating Structures. There's 33 activities. They're beautifully explained. Um, and then there's a great website. Yeah, shout out for LS. Um, how have you invested in yourself or your business to support you moving forward? I mean, a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my master practitioner in NLP, for one, um, the work I do within the School of Facilitation community and attending mm -hmm. events and giving myself the time um, to be with other yeah. facilitators and, and learn from other facilitators. Um, again, or originated from the School of Facilitation. I'm part of an accountability group where we meet uh, twice a month, um, once just to have a coffee and a chit chat, and um, once is a as an accountability call, where are you going with your business? Nice. What support do you need? Um, and I'm always on the lookout for the next thing, um, how I'm going to invest in me and my business. Okay, nice. Phil, thank you so much for this conversation today. It's been really great. Um, just noodling around looking in the boxes of your career where you've been what you've done sharing ideas um really appreciate your time so thanks for being here thank you i really appreciate the opportunity <laughs>